an initiative of the Greater Des Moines Partnership formed in 2007, the Business Innovation Zone, the Biz, exists to connect entrepreneurial needs with qualified resources and to provide guided professional and business direction. The Biz helps entrepreneurs maximize their successes by helping them navigate resources, strengthen knowledge, improve skills, form strategic alliances, and secure proper capitalization. To find out more about The Biz, visit www.bizci.org. Okay, so as you know, the billing for today was, uh, Drew was going to bring some top five lists, and then we were going to do a, a Q&A. Um, so I want to get through the list kind of quick so that we can get spend as much time on the Q&A as possible. Um, if you want a copy of the PowerPoint that has all the Q&A, uh, or all the top five lists, uh, Mike will have it on the Biz website. Uh, as you know, if you know anything about me at all, I'm all about creating content and reusing content. So those of you who subscribe to the blog or read my column in the business record, uh, you may see uh, bits and pieces of this there as well. You can also always email me uh, at drewmcclellanmarketing.com and just ask me to send it to you, and I'm happy to do that. You can use it ad nauseum with anyone you want. So, with that, so what I promised were uh, some top five lists. Oops. But we're instead, we're going to look at my company logo. <laughs> for now. Hang on. Let's see. Look at that. Okay. So here are my five. So first are uh, five marketing books that I think everybody should read. Um, <clears throat> to my, to uh, Mike's point about um, I'm not always about the hottest, newest, latest thing. This first book by Jay Baer is the only book that has been is out in the last I think six to nine months. Um, Jay's book just came out. Came out probably on uh, number three on the bestsellers list. And Jay's whole point is that. Marketing has shifted, and instead of selling now, what you need to be is you need to be a utility. You need to be helpful. And some great examples, some great case studies, some traditional media, some social media examples. Uh, Jay's a great storyteller, so it's a good read. So I recommend that. Uh, Anne Handley and Cece Chapman, about a year or so ago, came out with content rules. If you are uh, puttering around in content marketing, this is what I think of as sort of the primer. Uh, and content marketing, so it's a great book. Um, Harry Beckwith, if I only could read one marketing author in the world, it would be Harry Beckwith. Um, this book is probably 10 years old. He has a series of books. Uh, all of them are great, but this is my favorite. And this is the whole idea of how do you sell something that somebody can't put in their hand? And for so many of us, what we sell is intangible. And he talks a lot about um, how do you sell value and expertise and all those things. Um, really, a brilliant, brilliant author and marketer. <clears throat> uh, okay, so this is a great book. Uh, this is, book is all about the weird things that human beings do and that we think are so random. And it actually, this guy has done all these studies and they're absolutely predictable. So all of our irrational behavior is absolutely predictable. And it's fascinating, insightful into the way Human beings make decisions, which I don't care what you do for a living. This is a valuable book, and it's it's a it's a fun read. It's a great read. You will recognize yourself in a lot of really irrational stories. And again, if you'd like to color, change the color scheme. Right? <laughs> you know, I'm just telling you, none of this happens on me. <laughs> We have this whole stick where I would be seeing this. <laughs> so this is the book that will, anyone who knows me at all, this will surprise you because um, I went into marketing because I don't like math. And um, even though marketing is all about math. But this is a great book. This guy um, actually has written a lot of books about how Wall Street works and all of that. But it's all about how, how non-math people, people who do not for fun make Excel spreadsheets, can understand analytics and use them. So he's actually, for a math guy, a great storyteller. And you will read through it, and I promise you two things. One, I promise you you are underusing the data that is at your hands in terms of your customer, in terms of your website, and all of those things. There's all kinds of data there that would make you smarter and better, and you're probably underutilizing it. And number two, if you read this book, 
you will be more comfortable and ready to start digging into some of that data. So um, it's not a Jesse read, it's not a math equation read. It's, uh, again, lots of great stories, um, but very exciting. So those are my five. My bonus book uh, is an old book. I bet this is 10 years old. Becoming a Category of One by Joe Calloway. And it's all about building a brand. And um, this is probably, if I, if there was a book on a shelf that I wish I had written, it was this, it's this book. It's just a brilliant look at branding and how important that is to differentiate yourself, but in a completely different and fresh way from most branding books. So, um, put all those on your next stand. So, uh, now some websites. I promised you my website. So, this is Chris Ducker's website. And he talks a lot about the entrepreneurial experience and how to build a business and how to market that business. And whether you own your business or not, um, it's, he's, uh, it's fascinating. And he does a lot of interviews with other people, so lots of insights. And I tried on the website, uh, but I tried all of them until we get to the print publications. I tried to pick ones that I, I'm guessing are not as mainstream and some of you aren't as familiar with. Uh, this next one, Heidi Cohen, again, this is, um, she doesn't just write about social media, and I wish she'd had a different uh, article up when I had to grab the screenshot, because I don't think anyone needs to be a social media all-star, but um, she's a great overall marketing writer, and she writes in a very approachable way, uh, and she puts out a lot of content, so lots of good stuff to share with folks. Entrepreneur on Fire, this is a series of podcasts where they interview different entrepreneurs about different aspects of running a business, being in business, dealing with customers, marketing, um, and, it's, and it's people like Seth Godin. So it's not like we interviewed Joe, the guy who has the coffee cart um, in New York City. It's people who have really achieved incredible success in business, and uh, the podcasts are entertaining, and they are very uh, insightful. Social Media Examiner, I'm guessing most of you already looked at this one, but if you have any interest in social media, this is sort of, uh, these guys, these are, you guys are mashable without the hype, right? So they've kind of, a lot of how-tos, a lot of you should do this or you shouldn't do this, lots of examples, um, and, and very accessible. Uh, David Armano, uh, I met him, gosh, probably 10 years ago, and then he was working for some little boutique ad agency, and he was just sort of starting to come up in the social media world. And now he's the managing director at Edelman in Chicago. And he writes, his blog posts are really long, but he's this very thoughtful, he's an unusual art director in that he thinks strategy first, and then he thinks sort of visually. So his, his blog posts or his articles are very long, but really thought provoking. And they're a lot about how to do business today in the social space. It's not really about social media. So, you know, here he's talking about responsive marketing. As you know, everyone's talking about responsive design in the web. So he takes things bigger. Uh, very, very smart guy. So, uh, great for you. And then my bonus is hopefully all of you are already reading Marketing Pop State and Fix. Um, it's crowdsourced, they have lots of different authors. Uh, I've been writing for them for years, um, and lots of other folks have. But lots of great marketing content that is very broad. All right? So we did books, we did the web. So um, I'm a firm believer that even in today's day and age, magazines actually still have a lot of great content. So whether you read it on an iPad app, or you actually like the magazine itself, here are the magazines that I think we should all be reading. Most of them will not be a big surprise to you. So Fast Company, Entrepreneur, Inc. The Economist, this may surprise some of you, but it's a great, it's very insightful in trends. Uh, has some great articles, well written. Uh, Business Week, also another one that, especially if you're thinking uh, from a marketing mindset, great stuff. And my bonus for this one is, uh, you should still be reading your local newspaper or business journal. And here's why, I don't care if you don't have one customer in Iowa, <laughs> Iowa is about relationships, and whether it's vendors or suppliers or customers, whatever it is, you know, we, and that's true of the Midwest in general, but as the world gets bigger in terms of digital, it actually gets smaller in terms of relationships, and so 
you knowing what's going on in your local community, not only as a business person, but also as a person who has the privilege of having a job or a company in this community, you need to know what's happening in our community. You need to know who's doing that. There's no better source for that in terms of storytelling and all that than you know the register and the business. So that. All right. So I also promised you the five things that every one of you needs to be doing. Some of these, if you've heard me speak before, uh, are going to be repeats because you still need to be doing them. And hopefully some of them are new. And one of them is, and this stuns me, the statistics for what's happening with mobile, as all of you have your little mini computers on the table or in your pocket, the statistics of how this is coming at us like the tsunami that it is are staggering. And yet, still today, the majority of websites are not mobile ready. They are not optimized for mobile devices. So if you haven't done that yet, you need to do that. And you guys can talk to them, couldn't you? So my friend said towards your mobile here, happy to chat with you about that. But you need to figure out in your business, whatever it is you do and what your customers do, you need to understand how they're using mobile devices and how you need to intersect with that. Because very soon, a website that is not responsive in some way to, oh, it's an iPad, oh, it's an iPhone, oh, it's a whatever, um, are going to be just considered obsolete. And what it's going to say about your business is you're not current and that you are not in touch with today's reality. So pretty soon, just like uh, earlier in, in the web days, not having a website meant you weren't credible, very soon not having a website that is built for me access regardless of device is going to make you irrelevant to me, right? All right, number two, the thing you should be doing. I don't care what kind of content you, I am, I am uh, tool agnostic. So Facebook, Twitter, a blog, I'm not going to tell you that there's one that's better than the other. There is one that's better than the other for each of your businesses. It's not going to be the same one. But you need to be creating content. Back to Jay Bear's book, Utility, you, the, the new marketing sort of threshold is, if you're not helpful first, I don't care to do business with you. That's now becoming sort of the way we all think about doing business with you. If you have not been helpful, if you have not demonstrated to me, without me asking, by the way, because I don't want to talk to you yet, I just want to hang out on your web page, right? 67% of the buying decision is made today before they ever speak to someone who works at your company. And they've done all of that by pecking around on the web and reading up all about you. And if you haven't been helpful, and if you don't come off as being relevant and smart and accessible and approachable and all those things that you guys know, if I don't get that vibe from you, then I'm not going to pick up the phone and call you. So however you want to create content, you need to be creating content in some way that is sort of helpful to your prospects and your customers. We can talk about that more in the Q&A section. Okay, so here's one that I don't think we've talked about in this venue anyway before. So every week, I want you to call someone who has said no to you. Either they fired you, they used to be a client, and they're not anymore, or they picked someone else. And I want you to have a, and, and don't email them, don't text them. I want you to actually pick up the phone and call them and have a conversation. And the conversation doesn't, hey, you just want to check in, how are things going with whoever they picked instead of you, or boy, we miss you. And by the way, do not call the people that you are glad left. <laughs> <laughs> because remarkably what happens is just the, just the act of calling them and acting like you care <laughs> actually makes a lot of them come back. <laughs> So if there was someone that when they left, everyone went, yay, cross them off the list, okay? But you will be astonished at two things. One, what you learn, because now that they're not a client, or now that there's been some time passed, they will be much more honest with you about why they said no. And I don't care how good you are, there are some things you can do better, and you will learn some of those things. Some of them who were with you and went somewhere else probably aren't that happy where they went, Thought they were going to be, but maybe you caught them on the right day, and now they're thinking maybe they want to come back. Right? So, very insightful. Uh, and again, it's all about relationships. So, 
if you can demonstrate that you actually care about people who are not giving you money on a regular basis, right? It's part of your brand and part of your reputation. But you will learn a great deal. Uh, here's another one sort of along that line. Every business, and for some businesses it needs to be annually, for other businesses maybe every three years, every business should do a third party customer survey. Why? Because there are some things they will just not tell you. We do this a lot for our clients, and A, it's sometimes it's a little awkward to tell them what we learned, right? Because some you don't always hear great stuff, but B, we have never done it for a client when they did not make a major change in how they do business. That's how insightful, that's what they learned from that feedback. And they hear great things too, and they hear about employees that they didn't know were not getting out of the park, and they hear about employees that they thought were not getting out of the park, and maybe not so much. But you will, I promise you, if you do this, have somebody else, and what, and what we recommend is that you mix. So you do a, send a big group of clients or customers a written survey and a smaller group. You do some phone interviews so you can get some stories and, and some verbatims. And you, you blend those together. But I, I'm promising you, if you have a third party do this, every time you do it, you will improve your business. Every time. And the other thing this does is the clients that you actually ask this, that you ask them if they'll participate, and they say yes, you know what it says to them? We actually care about your opinion. And not only do we care about your opinion, we're going to send you a letter telling you we're going to do it, we're going to ask you the question, then we're going to send you a letter telling you what we learned, the good, the bad, the ugly, and what we're doing to fix the bad and the ugly. So now as a client, I know not only do you care about my opinion, but you actually listen, you're open to changing, and you know what? I might not have said the negative thing that you're fixing, even though it sort of gets under my crawl a little bit, and now I like you all better. So this is a great client retention tool. It's also a great system and process improvement tool, and, I and, you, and you cannot do it, because there are things they just won't say, because we're too Midwest nice. Even if, we're not, even if they're not in the Midwest, they, people will not be as honest. Okay, Mike and I were talking about this a little bit uh, when you guys were having lunch. So, a couple things. You need to understand why you exist, why your business exists. And by the way, it's not to serve all of mankind. <laughs> right? You need to know why you exist. You need to know, and this is a challenge for most businesses, you need to understand who your sweet spot customer is. And by the way, that list is a lot smaller than you think. It is not everyone who has a buck in their pocket. It is not every male 25 to 54. However you want to do that, it is a very narrow list. And when you know exactly who you are and why you exist and why you're different than anybody else who sort of does what you do, and you know exactly who you should do it for, that's a beautiful thing because all of a sudden, your marketing gets a lot easier because you know who you need to have conversations with. And honestly, you can ignore the rest of the people, some of them will overhear, and some people will come in anyway, and that's okay. It's not like you were to say to them, no, you can't be a customer, or no, you can't be a client, unless they're really a bad fit. But you're not going to expend energy or effort to chase them. You are only going to bother to talk specifically to the sweet spot customers. Why? Because you have a very, how many of you get, just all the marketing stuff you want to get done now, how many of you get it all done all the time? Anybody? Okay. How many of you have so much money that you have enough money to pay someone to do all the marketing stuff that you can't get done? Right. Okay. That's why you have to narrow the list. Because if you're going to expend energy, you want every ounce of that energy to be aimed at directly the person who is your sweet spot customer. Why? They're more likely to buy, they're more likely to stay, They'll spend more, and you have a better shot at making them very happy. And the reality is, if all of you thought about your businesses, and I say to you, okay, in the next room, there are a thousand people who want to buy exactly what you sell, but they all need it in the next week. How many of them could you take? So we think about this huge universe of customers, and the reality is, most of us couldn't onboard more than a handful at a time anyway. So 
Sales and marketing needs to be absolutely consistent. It needs to be something you do every day. So you need to get closer to both every day. You need to behave more like your why, and you need to spend more time getting closer to those sweet spot customers. So it has to happen every day, but just a little bit. Because the reality is, if you open the floodgates and all of a sudden 250 or 1,000 people, and depending on your business, that number will be different, that, what, that scary number will be different, but it's too many. So you need to really narrow your focus and say, you know what? I know the 150 people that I need to talk to in this market or in this industry or this whatever, and go at them with a vengeance and have a great marketing plan, but the, the rest of the universe, you don't need to worry about it. And that's very free in terms of how you spend your resources and your time. And my bonus one is, as you might imagine, since I promised five to give you six, always give a little extra. Always a little something extra. It usually costs you nothing, but it's noticed. Oh, and by the way, you can't always give the same extra, because after you give the extra five times in a row and it's the same, it's not extra anymore, not that expected. Right? So you also have to be a little creative. Alright, and with that, we have time for questions. Which I know is why you really came. So what do you got? Seriously, I don't have 30 minutes to write content, so. <laughs> <laughs> Susan, I think you had mentioned you wanted to talk about Vine versus some of the other video, and I of course asked you when you were chewing, sorry. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I raised my hands, but I had brown meat. Sure. <laughs> So, uh, again, I'm pretty tool agnostic. Right now, of all of the new, hot, short, mini video formats, Vine is winning. Um, but, you know, the VHS tape versus the beta tape, beta tape is one for a little while, too. So, here's, here's the trick. First, does your audience care? There's, there's a new social media tool out there every day. And you cannot possibly spread yourself thin enough. So, it may be that Vine is the hot thing, but really, the good old, this is how great, the good old YouTube, remember? The good old days, we just use YouTube. The good old YouTube may still be the go-to solution because you already have a channel, and you've trained your customers to go there. So be really careful about the hot new thing because just like you don't have time to explore it and use all of them, neither do your prospects and customers. But if you're choosing between those formats right now, mine is ahead of the game because it's sort of, um, it sort of stands alone on its own matter, I think, right now. But it's also very new. I mean, we've only been playing with these tools for you know a few months, so what, a year maybe. Um, so it's too early to say. But right now, find find quite a bit ahead in terms of use, in terms of usage, and in terms of shares and all that statistics wise. Yep. Um, in terms of direct mail, where do you think that's going? So the question is, uh, what's the deal with direct mail? Is the effectiveness wearing off? Actually, uh, Mike and I were just laughing about this, because he said, well, make sure you talk a little bit about traditional stuff. The hot new media right now, the media that is outperforming most other media, the new media is direct mail. <laughs> Why? Because we don't get all the junk in our mailbox like we used to, because everyone emails us. So now, all of a sudden, mail is kind of fun to get again, and we actually pay a little bit of attention. Which does not mean that your creative can be lazy, and you know it, it still means you have to use best practices of how direct mail works. But no, it's not going away. In fact, if anything, it's sort of seeing a rise in both popularity and effectiveness. So don't uh, don't stray away from the old dogs yet. Yep. At one point, did you feel comfortable using the media? Like you said, that you don't always jump for where it's hot. Right. At, is there like a threshold that you feel comfortable? Okay, so the question is, at what point is the new media not so new and it's safe to use? And honestly, the answer to that is your customers or prospects will dictate that. When there's no value in any of you using a media that the people you want to talk to aren't using yet. Unless, unless you're in a business where you're supposed to be the cutting edge leader and you're dragging people into new media, it's actually, if you know who your sweet spot customer is, and you're paying attention to where they're hanging out and what they're using, that's when it will be time. So you can be out ahead of them a little. So if you are in an industry where you've got
you've got a subset of prospects and customers that are sort of leading edge, and enough of them have gone there that it looks like everybody's going to go there in the next six to 12 months. There's nothing wrong with sort of being there waiting for them, but if, if it's an empty room, then you know, you're talking to no one. So it's not so much about how new the media is, because some stuff takes off you know, in, a, in a blink, uh, and other stuff it takes years to catch on, but it's really about your audience. Yep? Okay, what kind of media is most effective in the B2B? So, uh, trade pubs still are working, right? Um, trade shows are back. So, during the recession, a lot of people cut back on their trade show attendance, both as an attendee and also as an exhibitor. Uh, and now that the recession has sort of died down a little bit, that those numbers are back up. But what I will tell you is that you better be doing something pretty interesting on the trade show floor. So, if you just have a plain old booth, uh, people just keep walking by, and if you do something that really captures their attention, uh, you can create some buzz very inexpensively. Um, so those two things are working. Um, the other thing for B2B is direct mail is still working. Um, and, the, and LinkedIn actually is starting to, so we've talked about LinkedIn for a while, that that's becoming more of a business tool. <clears throat> people are actually starting to use LinkedIn better. Uh, so they're using it as more than just a Rolodex. And they're starting to share more content and have more conversations inside that tool, so that's working better. And they've got um, they've got some great tools if you want to mine that data. So if, again, if you know who your sweet spot customer is, LinkedIn very well may be a great place to go to, to sort of sort out that list. Um, their ad platform, if he's still, right? Unfortunately, there is no silver bullet. Marketing still takes a lot of legwork and a lot of personal. So it'd be awesome if you could just put it on autopilot and it would work. But if anyone has found that, I mean, that would be a beautiful thing. Yep. It's kind of an open-ended question, but what would be maybe the two or three um, big trends that you see for 2013? What are the two or three big trends for 2013? Yeah. Well, the, you know, trends take a while to sort of get, make some steam, and then they sort of get to a point where they're at critical mass. And we've been talking in this venue and other places about mobile for a while, and it, it, it is about to crash onto the onto the shore. So probably in terms of trends that you absolutely can no longer avoid, it's the mobile issue, number one. Uh, number two is the continuation of digital word of mouth. So the power of the customer referral, the, you know, every day on Facebook I see someone say, Hey, we need a photographer, we need a roofer, we need a whatever. Just just today I saw, hey, our air conditioner went out, who should I call? And what's fascinating to me about that is two things. One, in 10 minutes there were 30 answers. And two, more than 50% of those answers were don't call Bob. Don't <laughs> call this company. Yeah. So we are very free in the social space and digitally to talk about what we don't like as well. And and <coughs> whether it's someone I actually know, like I've met you a million times and we're friends, or someone I have this tangential relationship with, I trust the consumer pool more than I trust a, a paid ad. I mean, and we're seeing that over and over. But what happens is the combination of the two, when the paid ad gets my attention, and then I read the good things, that's, that's the magic combination. <clears throat> so part of what you need to be doing if you're not doing it now is, whether it's old-fashioned testimonials, or it is encouraging people to do online digital reviews if you have that kind of a business, you need to find ways to get people who love you to be more obvious and public about their love. And you also need to be much better at watching for the negative comments and dealing with those quickly. Because you need to put those to bed in, in a hurry. And, and deleting them, by the way, is not putting them to bed. Uh, again, yep. Yeah. Going back to the direct mail, it amazes me that I still get letters from the customer satisfaction that are very official looking on the book, with a warning that's holding to be open by me. And it is amazing to me that that kind of trickery or deception still works. So, open-ended, i just like to hear you talk about honesty and respect in marketing relationships and how can be possible. I'm not for either. <laughs> 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 everything we know about, this sweet spot that you're talking about, would go against that. Yeah. So, the, the question was, when we all get these letters that look like they're from FedEx or something and they look all official, 
explode. If you don't open them now, they're going to explode on your desk. And, and um, they're trickery. You feel, and you feel tricked when you open them. Um, it is my opinion that that does not encourage us to want to spend more money. So I think, I think it's always been good marketing to be as transparent and honest and real as you can be. I think today's consumers are demanding it and will call you out on it if you are not. So, you know, it used to be that if you said that sort of a thing, there was really nowhere to go with it. But today, if you wanted to expend the effort, and, you, and most people probably don't, you know, you could find that company's Facebook page or whatever, and you could call them out. And now they've got a problem on their hands. So, first of all, I think that most people are honest by nature and want to be that way. And I'm not really sure where we got the idea that we had to fool people into wanting to buy stuff. The reality is, short of sticking your hand in their pocket and taking their wallet, all you can do is hold up what you sell and wait for someone to want it badly enough that they can so if you can hold up that what you sell in one hand, and you can hold up some helpful stuff in the other, genuinely helpful stuff, they're more likely to hang out with you for a while to notice both. And I think the more you can be that, A, the more fun I think it is to be in business. B, I think the better the match is between you and your customer, so they stay longer, right? C, I think they are more likely to say good things about the buying experience. So again, you're creating that word of mouth trail. So I think there will always be people who think they have to fool us. And when, when that happens to me, what I think is, if their product was good enough, they wouldn't have to do this. So I actually discount whatever it is. They, they may be brilliant. They may be the best in their business. But if they have to fool me into opening an envelope, or they have to fool me into a trial of their product or whatever, then there's something wrong with what they so I think in the end, they pay the price. But I think it's, it feels kitschy. It feels, you know, I think sometimes it's easier to sell that up the chain because it's different and it's fresh and old. I also think, and for those of you that are inside a company, you know this, I think people who do marketing inside a corporation or an entity are under a lot more pressure today to get results faster. And I think some people think that's a shortcut. And in the end, I think they, they claim themselves. The rear end. Somebody over here. Yeah. Uh, two questions. You alluded to earlier. Uh, 2013 testimonials are still um, very much part of the point market. Question is 2013 testimonials, should they still be part of marketing? I, don't, I hope there is never a time when a happy customer isn't a great marketing tool. Right? Because I think that somebody who talks about either the way your product works or what it's like to work with you. Here's the thing, whether you're spending a dollar or a hundred thousand dollars, none of us want to be duped. None of us want to be tricked. And none of us want to buy something and feel dumb about it later. And so anything we can do as marketers to reassure the right customer that they are indeed at the right place and that, that we're going to give them something that they actually need and want and it's of quality, and if they make a bad buying decision, we will help them unmake that buying decision. Gets them to buy faster and with more confidence. So testimonials, absolutely. And number two, some of the more third-party circuit. Uh, sure. Is, is that uh, for an organization? Is that something you roll out maybe every five years? Is it something you do? So the, the question is, how often do you do the third-party uh, that anonymous survey? It depends on your organization and how often your customers buy and how big your customer base is. So for some of you, it may be something you should do annually. For others, three to five years might be okay. So it, it really, it, there's not a one size, in all marketing by the way, there is no one size fits all. And anybody who tells you that there is, or it always does it the same way, is going to smoke up your skirt. So, uh, but I think it, it depends. I would say probably there's no business where anything outside of five years makes sense? Because you want to be able to track trends, right? Yeah. Thank you. Yep. You talked to your second point about what you need to do is producing content. Yep. Let's just say there's a lot of content out there. Yeah, yours needs to be better than the rest of it. So when you talk about being helpful, give us some, some tips perhaps on how you can go through that process of figuring out what we're doing with helpful. Okay, so the question is, a ton of content out there. How's, how could yours actually be good and helpful. 
So uh, I think what most people in their content do is they regurgitate the same content that they've read somewhere else, and it doesn't actually tell me how to do something. Oftentimes it tells me I should do something, but it doesn't tell me how to do it. Or it only tells me the first half, because then you'll sell me in the second half in a beautiful ebook series, right? So I, I think it's, if you put on the hat, when you really understand your sweet spot customer, and you put on their hat, you say, what would, and if, and if you guys aren't familiar with the idea of personas, uh, we don't have time to dig into all that today, but creating a persona that really humanizes your sweet spot customer. So, so for us, one of our sweet spot customers is a guy named Ian. And when we say, I know it sounds crazy, but when we say, when Ian hear about that, we at a, as a company know who he is enough that we can go, no, Ian wouldn't care about that. Or what questions would Ian have after we read after we read this article? And then you can say, okay, so then I'm going to add three bullet points at the end that answer those questions. So the more you know your customer, the better your content will be. But but in general, if you can think of what your customer wants to know, what they're trying to do, why if they Googled up this phrase that led them to your blog post or podcast or whatever it is, what were they looking for? And then give it to them. And no, uh, if you give it to them, it doesn't mean they won't need to buy anything you sell. Because the reality is, you're going to give them just enough to get by. And for most people, that may be fine. But for the one out of ten or one out of a hundred, somebody's going to go, I need more than that. You know what? Drew's blog has been so helpful over the years that we're going to put out an RFP and I want to make sure this company answers it. Because I already sort of have a sense of who, they're, who they are and what they're about. So it's probably about being more complete and being um, more, not necessarily step by step, but that sort of a thing. Where it's like first you put it in the flour, then you put it in the butter, and then you put it in a bag, you wave it over your head, you know, whatever the. Uh, so, um, <laughs> let me over here, I have a question. Yes? You know, bribery with children, I think, is a fine thing. Um, it's a little harder with customers. I think there's a fine line. And I think you probably have to play with it a little bit to see where it is. So there is no reason why you could not provide incentive for doing that. But what you want to make sure is that the incentive does not imply that they only get it if they say good things. So uh, it, it is a, first of all, most of us are much too shy about asking people to do that sort of thing. So the first thing you have to do is just be a little more bold about asking people to, to write a review or to send in a testimonial or whatever. That's, you know, when, you're, when you've done a good thing for a, a customer or a client, saying to them, would you be willing to let us tell your story to other people? Or would you be willing to go online to Yelp or whatever your industry has and, and talk about your experience or Angie's List or whatever? Um, number one. Number two, for most of you, you're not the person who talks to the customer. You're the person who plans the marketing. So that's great. But if you're not the guy in my house fixing my plumbing, and he says to me, hey, how did you hear about us, Angie's List? You know what, it really means a big, it's a big deal to us to get Angie's List reviews. Would you mind uh, thinking about doing that? When that guy who just helped me asks, much more impactful than if I get a postcard from the company asking. So it's also about making sure your frontline employees understand both the value of it and you teach them, don't just tell them to ask because they don't know how to ask. Teach them how to ask and reward them for asking and reward them when their customer leaves a review. So you can do it internally. I, and again, there's nothing wrong with a little bribe. Just be really careful about the way it's worded so that you're not implying. You can have a free dessert if you say something nice about us, right? <laughs> but I would, I, I would ease into it and see where you get an uptake. And honestly, I think for most of you, just asking on a regular basis probably is all the bribe that you need. If you've provided a great product or service, they are happy to thank you in some way, and it's so easy today to sit and do it right on your phone. It's not like you're asking them to do something 
painful. Well, what I've learned in the graphic, though, is that um, they're not quick to go online and to create the account that they need to create to leave a review. Okay. So, um, you know, for the younger people, you know, it's great. Sometimes we just get, you know, not quite a great response to that. They're so important. So, either I would collect them in an old school way and use them differently. Or B, tell me a little bit about more about your demographic. Um, well, we're facial plastic surgery, so okay. typically uh, women, okay. and 45 to 65. Um, and are you doing procedures that, as a woman, I want all my female friends to know I had, or I do not? Sometimes not. Okay. And, you know, we even, we would be thrilled that people would just review our consultation process, or how our staff greeted them. Right, but I'm implying that I was there, right? So part of it for you is, um, and a lot of you may have this, part of this for you is your customer may not want to tell the world that they're buying whatever it is you sell. So that's that's a bigger challenge. So it can be anonymous. Huh? It can be anonymous on any of the sites that we give them. They're medical-related review sites. Okay, so then what I would do is I would have some iPads in, in the waiting room and whatever, and I would at some point, and you'd have, you'd have to think through the buying process, at what point it's appropriate to say, you know what, we love helping women just like you. And as you know, because you probably experienced it, a lot of women are nervous about trying this. Would you be willing to, to just type a, a couple lines about your experience? And i sit there and i could create the account for them. I, I mean, I would have a, a nurse or an admin person or somebody actually sit with them and then kind of turn the screen to let them write what they want to write in private. But I would offer to do it because I think in many cases, in your case, they either don't know how, they don't even know it exists, but they probably would be willing to, if if they are willing for their friends to know they were there and they had whatever procedure they had, they would probably be happy to do it, but they don't know how. So I would, I would take that don't know how part out. Okay? Yeah. As an agency, we work with a variety of different clients across a lot of different industries. We love them all. And I'm curious, like, how, how do you compare uh, the value of, uh, oh yeah, we do work all over this industry and can provide you uh, an experience process versus, hey, we're exclusive to your industry and we're going to make our primary focus all on you for this. For most businesses, there's the discussion of should I be a generalist? Or should I be a specialist? And in the agency world, most agencies have verticals that they have a depth of experience in. So in the ideal world, you've been around long enough that you have both the breadth of experience and you have a depth. And, and so for us, we actively pursue clients that are in some of those verticals because we can talk about the depth. And if somebody who's not in one of those verticals just wants our breadth comes in, then they've already self-selected that they don't need Special. So the reality is, our expertise is in marketing. So do we need to learn our clients' business? Absolutely. Do we need to learn about their customers? Absolutely. But honestly, the discipline that we bring into the mix is the marketing part of it. So if you, all you have to do is be a higher education expert, then colleges would do their own marketing and they wouldn't hire agencies, right? So I think it's the blend of both. I think you have to be willing, and this is true for all of you in whatever, I think you have to be willing to roll up your sleeves and learn your customers or your clients' specific business or challenge. But what you sell is your expertise, and I think you need to stand firmly on that and say, this is this is why you hire me. Because I am an invested outsider that can look in in a way and see your business and your customers in a way that you can. Because you are inside the bottle, so you can't possibly see the outside of the bottle accurately. So I think one of the dangers of being too specialized you become an insider, and now you can't see it objectively. So I think I think for an agency, you need to find balance. One of the interesting things I try to sponsor for that is like search engine optimization. Like if I optimize for your business in this industry, right. how am I going to optimize that next client beyond that? Um, so I, I guess my follow-up question would be on your, your thoughts on, on SEO overall. SEO, as, as you know from your former life, SEO is, a, is this thing that is constantly changing. But one of the things that I take a lot of heart in is that all, a lot of the gaming of SEO is, a lot of it is starting to go away or be downplayed. And 
content is really organic content is really driving a lot of search. And so let me ask you this, how many of you, when you Google something, you know, you get the part in the shaded box, and then you get the stuff in the white. How many of you click in the shaded box? Okay, look around. If you're spending a ton of money on search, what you just said is you don't click where you're spending your money. Because we all know as consumers that those are ads. And we prefer organic content that says, that Google says, hey, Drew, this is actually what you're looking for. Not that someone buy, bought a spot to say, hey, Drew, click here. So I think, the, again, back to the content thing, I think the more you can, and then this also gets down to understanding your why and your sweet spot, because you don't need to be creating content about eight bazillion different topics. You need to be creating content about your sweet spot customer, what they care about, and what you're great at, and if you do that consistently, you'll impact SEO. It doesn't mean that there aren't appropriate times to spend some money there as well, but I think it's start, I don't, I don't think that's enough anymore. It used to be you could buy your spot and it was fine, but I think that's involved. I think the, I think the search consumer is getting sad. Yes? So kind of based on that, if you're a, primarily a web-based company, yep. is philosophy to different different ways? Is philosophy focused on marketing on the web or you want people to find you anyway, or do you employ some traditional methods as well to drive people I would think there are very few exceptions to what I'm about to say, which is I think the combination of the two is always going to be more popular than putting your, all your eggs in either basket. Your consumers are human beings, they don't spend their whole life online. So depending on who they are and what they care about and where they hang out, I suspect that there are some offline things you could do to drive them online. Or it may be that you get them online, but you do something with your existing customers, and you give them something tangible to give someone else to drive that person online. So now what I'm doing is, you know, we all love to be helpful, and we all love deals, but what we love more is giving our friends deals. Why? Because then we look like we're an insider, right? So if I get, if I buy something from you, and I get a coupon, and I know that Greta could use it, if I give her that coupon that you've gone offline with me because it was packaged with whatever I bought, right? Um, and even if you even if you don't sell me a thing and everything I buy stays online, let's say I download software for you, right? You can still email me something that I can print out or forward or whatever. Give it to Greta, and now that's really an offline tactic, even though even if it got transmitted digitally, that's human to human, right? And now you're I've become my own little yelp. Right? And I'm telling Greta, these guys are great, go ahead and buy it. So I, I am pretty sure that there are some offline things we need to be doing as well. Here's the other thing about marketing. Um, you should not be doing 97 things. You should be doing four or five things a lot and really, really well. One of the biggest mistakes marketing people make is they think, we have to have a newsletter, we have to have a podcast, we need a blimp, and we need to be at 12 trade shows, and we need this... You don't. You need to figure out, again, your why, your sweet spot customer, what are the three or four places, tactics, whatever you want to call them, where you're going to find them, and be really good at that. Right? So instead of just cranking out a newsletter once a month, and I know none of you do this, but the day before it's due going, oh, a newsletter, what are we going to write about the newsletter? What are we going to write about the newsletter? actually investing some time and energy to making that a great tool, to making that a utility tool, do that rather than do three other things as well. Yes? Can you talk some more about the, the concept of the sweet spot customer? I really just want to do that because I think we make a lot of assumptions on who we think our sweet spot, sweet spot customer is and just yeah. confirm whether those are true or not. Yeah, okay, so the question is, can we talk a little bit more about sweet spot customers? How do you identify what that is? How do you balance assumptions, right? <clears throat> so the first thing is, it takes some time. It really does take a while to dig into that. It's not a, oh, well, we know that only women shop here, and so we're going to pick 25-year-old women, and that's it. It really does take some time, but you start with looking at your current customer base. What is, what is common amongst the customers that stay with us a long time, 
that keep spending more money, and here's the key, that we make so happy that they tell other people about it. That begins to help you have some clues. So when you figure out who those people are, if you start to sort of lay their profile out on the table, and by the way, most businesses don't have one suite of bot customers. You probably have two or three. I would suggest you don't have more than three, which means that you're going to have to have some, some prioritization as you do that. But lay them out and go, you know what? If we had a bunch of clients just like this person, and look, these other three people sort of fit into that category, that would be awesome. If we had it, and then and they'll sort of sort out. And they may not sort out by age or gender, it may be by the need they have or the life circumstance they're in. So again, it completely depends on your business. But if you spend like an afternoon, <clears throat> assuming you've already gathered all the data, right? So you've got to know who spends money, how often they spend money, you've run those metrics. But if you spend an afternoon or a day sort of sorting through that, you will have a pretty good idea of who's my customers are. And then you test it. And you see, okay, if we attract four more Ians, if you're MMG, did that work out well for us? Is that not, oh, maybe, you know what, maybe we're wrong. Or maybe it's Ian, but we have to add this element to it. So the other thing that happens with your sweet spot customer is you'll start kind of broad, and then as you start marketing to those subsets, you'll start recognizing you can go more narrow and more narrow. So instead of talking to 10,000 people, you'll get down to 5,000. Then you'll add a couple more elements and you're down to 1,000. And pretty soon you might be down to a couple hundred, but if you could get two of those couple hundred every year, you'd see 20% growth. Right? Other questions? Yep. About a year or so ago, there were quite a few companies here locally. Everybody did Facebook campaigns to buy this on Facebook. How relevant was that? Um, we like everything. We as human beings like free stuff. We don't like to tell our friends that we don't like them. So a lot of times we like things and then we hide it or we don't look at it again. So it really, you absolutely can gain any marketing thing you want. I can, I can trick any of you into doing all kinds of things. But at the end of the day, it doesn't serve me to do that because you'll, you'll do that one thing to make me happier because you don't want to embarrass me or you don't want to embarrass yourself or because you can get a free thing. But then you can equally, easily ignore me from that point on. So um, if the trick or the gimmick is tied to what you do and it will attract your sweet spot customers, your sweet spot customers are like, I gotta have me some of that, then I think you're fine. If it's the generic, uh, click here and then we'll give a dollar to you know, a, a charity or whatever, you'll get a lot of likes and maybe you need that for credibility. I mean, you know, business should have more than four likes, right? Um, so if you need it for credibility, okay, maybe you can argue you can do it. But if you're actually thinking, I have 2,000 people that like my page, so now these 2,000 people are paying attention to me, you're fooling yourself, unless you've attracted them for the right reasons. So again, it's sort of like your question, it's, it's short-term gain, but really at the end of the day, it probably doesn't serve you very well. Okay. Because it suggests that the old way is bad now. Yeah, or, or updated. Okay. Um, two, can't hear anything on the words of this part. But um, I, I think if that's who you are, if that's your sweet spot, that you're this innovative company that, and you're a maverick, then I think you go right at it. And you know what? 80% of the people are going to freak out, but the 20% are your sweet spot customer, and they're the ones who are going to buy anyway. And if you tiptoe in, you don't feel innovative or maverick. And you feel like you're trying to kind of play both sides. And they don't want that. So again, I think you have to know, I know I sound like a broken record, but you need to know who that customer is and be confident enough in your offering to be what you are. If you are a giraffe, you cannot pretend to be a tiger. We're on to that, right? So if you are, whatever you are, go and be that. And know that 80% of the world is either won't care 
or will think that you suck, or will think that they don't need you, or whatever, and that's fine. Because the other 20% will go, that's, those are the people for us. So go ahead. And I, and I, I mean, I don't think you have to be mean, right? But I think, I think it's okay to say we found a better way. And especially in today's world, but innovation, you know, if somebody says they're innovative, it's the magic word. So it's a great time to be a maverick. I think we're, I think a lot of people are looking for a better way. Okay? May I have time? All right. Thank you.